You know what time it is? It's iType time. You guys might remember this camera from the last video that I did on the Polaroid 600. And that is because it is the exact same camera. I ended up finishing it, messaging the client, uh, and basically just saying, hey, your camera's all film tested. It's 100% working, it works on flash, it works on regular mode, it is ready to be shipped back. Uh, I said, and it was just the camera that you wanted to me to fix, right? Uh, you didn't want me to do any other mods like the iType conversion. To which she said, what's that? A little bit of chatting later. And here I am, simply just waiting for the parts to come in stock so that I can do another iType conversion. Now this will be the second iType conversion that I featured on this channel, uh, with the first one being a one-step that I iType converted, uh, a one-step SX-70, so a box-type SX-70. Um, now the main difference with this conversion on a 600-type camera versus the one-step is that on the one-step, being that it's designed to take uh, SX-70 film, I had to modify the internal capacitor. But this camera, we're not gonna need to modify anything except for powering it off of AAA. So we're gonna be installing a battery holder right about here. And the reason being is that iType film and 600 film are completely identical. They are exactly the same format of film. It is just that 600 film has a built-in battery. So you can see these two terminals at the bottom. And iType film does not. That's the main difference. Otherwise, they are the same emulsion, they come from the same batch. Everything else about the film is completely identical. Um, but there is a big advantage to shooting iType film over 600 film. And uh, really, that's two things. Uh, the first is cost. It's much cheaper. Here in Australia, uh, a five pack of film of iType versus 600 is about $30 cheaper. So another way of thinking about that is every five pack you buy, you basically get a pack of film for free. And the other thing that is the ad advantage for iType film is availability. I've spoken to the head of uh, Brands Australia who sell Polaroid here in Australia. And he said that for every single pack of 600 film that they sell, they sell a five pack of iType. So as a result, you will find that most stores carry iType film. Uh, quite a lot will carry 600 film. Very few stores carry SX-70 film, at least here in Australia. Although I'm told it's pretty similar around the West, the, the Western world, <laughs> around the rest of the world. Um, and the reason for that is very simple. It's just a game of numbers. Although a lot of people like myself are really nerdy for the original classic Polaroid SX-70, the fact is that the humble little 600 box camera outsold the SX-70 by a factor of roughly 20 to 1. So there are way more of these things floating around than there are SX-70s. And 600 cameras have the advantage that because they are a simpler design and they use flash to mainly dictate exposure as opposed to the electric eye, these are typically a lot more reliable than an SX-70 camera. Of course, they can have things go wrong with them, which was the whole point of the first part of this video where the flash had actually died. One of the uh, components had blown and shorted and was dumping the six volt straight into ground, uh, meaning that the camera wouldn't power up. Um, but these, these make really, really good cameras. They're relatively cheap. And when they're converted to iType film, you get the advantage that you can run 600 or iType film at the flick of a switch. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do here. Now I must say that the modification I'm about to do is the easiest on these very square, chunky uh, 80s type cameras because these are very angular. It is very easy to attach the battery back to the rear of the camera. You can do this for the slightly rounded 90s camera. Uh, it's just that you've gotta be a little bit more creative with how you mount the battery pack because it has a slight curve to it. Not impossible, I've certainly built them before, uh, but it is much easier on these 80s models. So, uh, this is kind of a part two to the series. Um, in part one, I repaired the actual camera, I cleaned inside it. Uh, since then, I film tested it, I can guarantee this 100% works. It didn't need any adjustment to the flash or the electric eye. It just straight up worked out the box 
once I fix the flash. Um, but what I am going to do is just open it up, install the new battery compartment, and uh, yeah, show you guys how the iType conversion works. Um, but before that, I need to modify this little battery box. Uh, I described why in the iType video that I did on the one step, but I'll describe it again. Uh, there's two halves to this battery box. It's got a little door, then it's got the uh, actual AAA holder itself. There is a switch on the AAA battery holder, but the switch is on the side that I want to attach to the camera, so that's not going to do it all. So I do have to uh, modify the little switch box. And the things that I'm going to need for this conversion today are, of course, some simple hand tools, so little screwdrivers. Uh, I'm going to need my soldering iron, which is just off to the side of the camera. Uh, I had someone message me in terms of what soldering iron to buy. Uh, the key to soldering irons is you want one with variable temperature. Uh, anything that has variable temperature is automatically going to be better quality than one of those sim simple, uh, what I call a pencil stick soldering iron, which is just kind of, you've got the soldering iron and then just a cable that runs straight to mains power. Those things typically only have one setting, uh, well, two settings really, there's off, and then there's like 8,000 degrees scorching everything that you try and work on. Um, get one with a variable iron and get one with a tip that you can replace that is as fine as possible. That is going to help you out a lot. Uh, other tools we're going to need, a little flat-headed screwdriver, I've got my little bendy screwdriver, and we're also going to need a nice iced coffee because I'm in Perth, Western Australia, working in the middle of summer, and holy crap, is it hot! <sighs> so, uh, yeah, we're definitely going to need that for hydration. And, uh, We'll also need a little bit of wire. Um, again, one that I have recycled from a computer because my spirit animal is a womble and I recycle absolutely everything that I get my hands on. And uh, yeah, we're basically just gonna start by modifying the switch. So <laughs> in the one step video, I had someone comment and say, what are you doing? You know, you're burning your desk with this soldering iron. Um, I did answer that question in another video, but in case you missed it, guys, don't you worry about what I do to my desk, okay? Um, the truth is, this isn't a desk. This is a piece of wood that I've put on top of the desk for the very reason that it enables me to do whatever I like to it without damaging the desk. <laughs> so, don't worry. I have not gone crazy. I'm not doing soldering on a surface. Uh, you know, that I care about. It's totally fine. Don't worry your little heads out there in the comments section, okay? Um, but the truth is I need to add a little leg to this spring so that I can fold it over and I could set up one of those little, you know, claw things that will hold the two components together, but man, ain't no one got time for that and this works just as well. Um, also, a wooden surface like this, wood doesn't, condite, uh, do doesn't, condite, doesn't conduct heat as well as metal does. So, it's actually quite hard to burn this surface. I'd have to really try. Uh, what I do tend to burn though is my fingers, because this, this stuff gets very, very hot. That's better. And uh, yeah, we basically just got to... Ouch, 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 ouch. There we go. Get that leg, put it into position. And now we can slide it uh, back into the other little side of the switch mechanism. And yeah, we, we pretty much just have to build the switch box first. Uh, nobody makes um, battery holders that have the switch on the other side. Um, and it's fine, I don't mind doing a little bit of extra work because the battery holders that I'm purchasing here for use are really high quality and out of pure coincidence, the type of ABS plastic and the finish that they're made of is practically identical to the original Polaroid 600. Um, it is so close in terms of its finish that you would swear it was a factory modification. Now, while I'm soldering on the switch, I've just got some blue tack um, I don't know. Do you guys have blue tech in the USA? I know I get a lot of Americans watch these videos. Do you guys have blue tech? Is that like an Australian thing? 
It's like a sticky putty thing that you use to like put posters on the walls and stuff. I realize that I've like talked about it before, but I'm like, is this even a product that exists overseas? Um, I have no idea. If you have it, let me know in the comments below. And uh, yeah, we're just gonna add that extra wire. Um, but I like Bluetech because it just holds stuff in place when I, uh, my fingers can't. And it's very cheap and it does the job. There we go. And we'll just trim the little extra piece of wire off. Great, so that side is done. Uh, I'm just gonna make sure that the white lead is the same length as the black lead, because this piece of wire is long enough that I can then do a second camera, so I'm just gonna put that off to the side. Uh, but yeah, if you ever tear apart any kind of electronics and there's little bits of wire inside, and you do electronics projects a lot, it's very valuable to keep them. You never know when you're gonna need a little short length of wire. Uh, next thing I'm gonna do is just drill a hole in the uh, in the battery holder. Uh, let me get my appropriate size drill bit. This one should do the trick. Yep, that'll do. And my drill. I'm just gonna do this off camera so I can dangle it off the bench. But you guys get the idea, it's just literally drilling a hole. Okay, so we've just drilled through the battery box and that's gonna enable us, instead of the wires poking out of the original hole on the side of the battery box, it's now gonna poke down. Uh, next thing that I'm gonna do is use some double-sided tape. Now this stuff is double-sided foam body molding tape. It is automotive grade. It is the best material that I've found to attach the battery holders. Um, you could use small screws. And initially I thought about doing that, but then I realized that this stuff is like designed to hold, you know, panels onto cars <laughs> and really exist in like all weathers. And if you've ever used this stuff, you'll know like once that's stuck down, it is so hard to get off again. So I've got my two bits of tape. We will have to drill through that top bit of tape again because I've just covered the hole, uh, but we'll do that when I insert this onto the camera. All right, so let's just put the switch assembly back in. So we'll route the wires off to the side. And uh, then we can start work on the camera. Uh, now what I'm gonna do while I've got that switch mounted in nicely, I'm actually just gonna melt the little plastic lugs that hold that switch assembly in and that's just gonna keep it held down so that it's not flopping around. Great. All right. We're gonna put the positive lead in in a minute. All right, so that is the battery box all prepped, all taken care of. Now we need to get inside the camera, which I showed you guys the other day. So I'm not really gonna go into too much depth um, other than I do have a pack of film in here. Uh, which actually belongs to the client. So uh, they actually sent me a pack of film inside the camera. And I, um, I didn't know it at the time. So when I removed it, when I removed the pack of film, it actually got a, a bit of light leak on it. But the rest of the pack of film will, will kind of do just for testing purposes. So I'm just inserting a, a pack of film over and onto the top. There we go. Just put that down and away. So yeah, now there's no power to the camera, uh, but the flash was charging before. So we will need to 
uh, decouple that flash capacitor. Or not decouple it, um, decharge it. I'm gonna get the top flash housing apart. Uh, there's like little plastic clips in here. They will eventually come loose. Someone in the comments asked uh, on the last video, like what exactly part I was pressing on, because they they sort of could kind of see but couldn't couldn't quite get it themselves. And they asked if they were missing anything. Um, and my answer to that is simply that they were just missing the experience. That's all. Um, I've been doing this for a long, 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 long time. There we go. So yeah, just making 100% sure that that capacitor has um, been discharged. Because you do not want to be zapped by it. It hurts a lot. Um, so yes, warning. I gave a warning in my last video. Do not attempt this at home if you don't like the idea of being electrocuted. Uh, those capacitors, whilst very unlikely, to do any real damage uh, can give you a very nasty shock. Like it's not likely to kill you unless you have a pacemaker or something like that, but man, they hurt. They do not tickle at all. I'm getting deja vu here. Don't want to lose that little side door latch and we can put the shutter just off to the side that shutter is in perfect condition now one of the things we have to do this little metal tongue inside the base of the camera this is going to prevent insertion of eye tight packs of film uh, this is also a camera that has a tripod socket so we need that little metal piece in there because that's what holds the tripod socket in but what we don't need is the little tongue piece that sits uh, and points upwards. So I'm just gently going to remove that. And Polaroid made this out of varying grades of metal. This is one of the stronger grades. By the time the 90s rolled around, they um, kind of cost reduced it. And it was made out of a material that's very, very easy to bend backwards and forwards. Um, I'm going to try and give that a bit of a snip with my little side cutters here. It's very, very strong. Um, and after doing so, the idea is that I should just be able to bend it backwards and forwards until it snaps. Because we, we really just don't want that top piece. Now, if this doesn't do it through the bending technique, then I'll have to get the Dremel out and I'll probably just do that off camera to cut this piece off. Um, but yeah, they made this out of very, very, very strong material. But this part, yeah, it really just has to be removed. We're getting somewhere, guys. Um, yeah, with, uh, with other 600 cameras that don't have the tripod socket or the 90s models, uh, they are a lot easier. Oh, yeah, I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what grade of steel polar would use. It's so strong. Like it's just, it is just laughing. <laughs> just laughing at my bending backwards and forwards. So yeah, that's gonna be, that's certainly gonna be a Dremel job. Um, all right, out comes the Dremel, I guess. Um, I just said before I was going to do it off camera, but I might as well just do it on camera. Uh, but this is really crucial, this part. Yeah. 
And again, I just want to cut it enough, yeah, so that that happens. That's it. All I needed to do. All right. Um, so yeah, the reason that I was so adamant about cutting that, that little tongue out is inside this particular model, not all 600s have this, but there's a little tripod socket and the tripod socket is held in place with that metal tongue. Should you have a camera that doesn't have a tripod socket, well, you could just remove this little metal, metal piece. It doesn't actually do anything. The only thing it does is hold in tripod sockets and prevent you from inserting what Polaroid would have deemed, you know, the wrong type of film. So, and now that that part's been removed, we can just crimp it down and now we can reinsert it back into the camera, just making sure it's nice and flat and won't stick on anything. Now that is the only extra little advanced step that was required for this. All right, now we've got to attach the battery back to the camera. And in a 600 series, uh, you guys, if you watched my one-step video, the one-step video, I mounted the back slightly off-center because of the some specific SX-70 box type accessories clipped onto the viewfinder. That's not the case with 600 models, so we can actually be a bit more concerned about the aesthetics here. And we can get it just dead center. now. Try not to press it down until you're absolutely certain you're in place. Because uh, once this goes on, it pretty much ain't ever coming off ever again. Yeah, there we go. Dead center. Okay. And that's it. That ain't... <laughs> like, this tape that I use is so strong. Once it's on, it's not going to come off. All right, now I've just got to drill the hole that goes through the body of the camera and into the rear. Now, although I'm drilling a hole in the body, there's really no need to worry about light leaks or anything like that. Um, the hole that I'm drilling actually goes through that foam double-sided tape, so it is completely light sealed. And also, the actual mirror box of the 600 is also completely light sealed. So there's, there's no need to worry about leaks or anything like that that can happen. Um, it's gonna be completely fine. So we'll just get a slightly larger drill bit though, I think, just to make that hole a little bit bigger because it's gonna make my life much easier when it comes to poking the cables through. That's better. Great. Now make sure you just blow away and get rid of any excess plastic. You don't want any of that ending up in the rollers or in the mirror box or anything like that. And now we can just start to poke through those wires and have them come onto the inside. And then of course we get our positive battery lead. Now that everything else is in, we can put this in. Put that back into the battery box. It just clips in place. Poke through the red wire if it wants to go. There we go. Just enough room to fit all three. Now the reason I've got three wires, um, I mean I'm sure if you've wired up these kind of battery boxes before you'll understand what it is that I've done, but what I've actually done here is instead of setting up the switch, which is two positions, instead of, instead of setting it so that one is on and one is off, I've set it so that one is battery power and the other is internal 600 power. So what that means is if you run out of 
AAA batteries, you can just use a pack of 600 film. Very handy. All right. So what we want to do now is hook up the battery leads. So on a 600, so little effort goes into assembling them that the wires that provide power are not even soldered in. They're actually just crimped in. So you can, you can literally just remove them like that. Isn't that amazing? These things were assembled, like I actually, I have to admire just how simple the construction is of these inside, that it's, it's practically toolless. Other than a few splodges, all you need is really the knowledge of how to get inside one of these, and you can do all kinds of stuff. So I'm gonna grab some heat shrink. Uh, let's cut some heat shrink there we go. to go over the wires. And basically what, how I'm going to wire this is the black wire is going to go to the camera's power. So this is the negative lead. Can you guys see what I'm doing? Yep, it's all in center. Great. Now we'll have to trim the excess lead off. Get a lighter. Just fold that back. Heat shrink comes out just to cover where I've soldered. And there we go. Now we can put that wire back in a second. Now, the next wire I'm gonna wire up is the white wire, and that's also going up. That's gonna to go to the negative. So what we can do is give it a little bit of a twist. And feed it through. And this one I will solder to the terminal. So effectively the switch is working on the negative lead. Now the last thing I'm gonna do is just also solder in the positive lead of the batteries to the positive lead inside the camera. If I can get it in, there we go. Brilliant. Trim off the little excess there. Uh, what I want to do now, just to help this battery lead stay in place, I'm going to hook it around a little nub of plastic where it came from. And now it should just be a matter of putting the body back together, making sure that the leads just sit nicely tucked in. There's plenty of room for them to sit behind the mirror box. What you may want to do is just use a little pick or something just to just to pull on those those leads and make sure they're all going in and behaving themselves as you put it back together. Just making sure they all sit in the right spot. And it's time to get everything aligned and put back together. And then I'm gonna put in some AAA batteries and we can test everything.
All right. Now, I realize that my AAAs at the moment that I usually use are currently in another battery back, so let me just get them out. That's one. And I'll actually talk a little bit about these batteries. I love these batteries so much that I may even do a separate video on them. Uh, but these batteries have been life-changing for me. These are actually made by a brand called Kratax. You can get them on eBay. And they are actually lithium-ion batteries. So lithium-ion batteries are usually like 3.6 volt, 3.2 volt. But inside this, this AAA-sized battery is not only a lithium-ion battery, but a tiny buck converter at the end that reduces the voltage down to 1.5 volts. So there's 1100 uh, milliwatt hours in these batteries and they're completely rechargeable. So Kratax will actually supply you with a little USB-C charger. And when they die, you can just recharge them. They last for an incredibly long time and they are more than powerful enough to run the camera. Um, I really love these. They work great in all photography applications. They work really well in flashes, that kind of stuff. The only thing that these do struggle with a little bit is SX-70 sonar cameras. Uh, and that's because of the ripple produced by the buck converter. It's, it's not a particularly steady voltage. And it makes the sonar assembly do funny things. You can fix that though if you're using this in like an external power supply for an SX70 sonar, such as like the Retrospect um, adapters, which is the, uh, that was actually the battery back I was just pulling them out of. I've, uh, I actually own one of the prototypes of those um, that existed before, um, before Retrospect made the, the final version. And uh, you can fix that weird sonar behavior by installing a little smoothing capacitor. Uh, that's probably something for a, a different video though. Um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about the AAA batteries that I was using in case someone saw them and goes, oh, what brand are those? So let's just put those off to the side. I'm gonna reassemble the rest of the camera first. Uh, I'm gonna put on, yeah, the housing and do this. Uh, yep, it's in the off position. I'm gonna put in the little trigger. And yeah, provided that I've wired everything up correctly, which I should have. Oh, spring's coming off. Uh, yeah, when I put a pack of film in and put in the batteries, everything should work. And yeah, the hardest part about a 600 is the fiddly process of getting them back together. These cameras are yeah, very simple in terms of their design. And as I said, you don't really need many tools to get into one of these. Um, the knowledge is actually more important, like knowing where to press and where to click and how they go back together is actually far more important than the tools in this case. Here we go. Plug in the ribbon cables. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to demonstrate how this AAA battery works uh, because there is a, a strange, funny behavior that happens after AAA converting one of these cameras. So I'm just going to show you that now. Uh, because I'm going to send this video to my client. I said, hey, your camera's likely going to end up in a video. Um, and so I'm going to tell them to go straight to the end because there is one strange behavior that happens with these AAA conversions. And so let's put the iType pack of film in. All right now, at the moment, the battery adapter is set to the right. So when it's set to the right, the little switch, it's gonna be using 600 film power. When it's set to the left, it should come to life and use the AAAs. There we go. It's gonna charge the flash. We'll wait for it to turn green. Beautiful. And that's it. Really simple as that. Um, then obviously you put the little housing uh, onto the back, make it nice and neat. And you have what I think is a very, very clean modification. Now, of course there is a little external lump on the rear of the camera. However, as I said, the finish perfectly matches the rest of the camera. 
And the thing I like about this AAA battery adapter, it doesn't actually add anything really to the footprint of the camera. Like, it takes up the same amount of space really, because that part is on the sloped surface. So it doesn't really add any extra size, but it does add a whole bunch of functionality now. And hypothetically, if Polaroid decide that's it, we're not doing any film with batteries in it anymore, well, you're covered. Now, I said that I would show you a weird behavior, and that is this. When you go, when you're finished with this pack of film, and you go to load in another pack of film, what you need to do is just make sure that the door to the camera stays open the entire time. So, let's say, you know, this was a new pack of film, you would take out your old pack of film, do not close the door, put your new pack of film in, then close the door. The reason being is that these cameras are not designed to have power without a pack of film. So if you have power going to the camera without a pack of film, the actual mechanism that controls the film counter never gets set and the camera constantly ends up in the dark slide eject cycle. So with no pack of film in, if you close the door, That motor just runs forever. So if you accidentally close the door, don't worry. Grab your old empty pack of film, put it in the camera, close the door again. Now it's back to normal, okay? So when you're changing the pack of film, just make sure you leave the door open when you swap them. Alternatively, you could, if you're shooting iType, you could just turn it off, right? But yeah, that's really the only thing that you have to worry about. Otherwise, this is a really great conversion. I really, really like this. And I especially like doing this conversion on the Polaroid 660 autofocus and the 670 autofocus, which have the, the gold sonar dish. Because when you convert those cameras, you end up with a real I-type monster. Um, triple element lens, focusing down to two feet, flash built in, really good, like, performance all around um, but yeah if you're after like bang for buck in terms of like a 600 type camera I highly recommend getting one of these modifications done because the only real alternative is Polaroid's modern eye type cameras and there's a real disadvantage to them which I'm gonna do a whole video about one day uh, let me see if I can find one here we go the big advantage to using a classic 600, I mean, personally, I think they look better. But these modern i-type cameras, like the Now and the Plus and stuff, the battery for this is built in. It's lithium ion. One of these days, it's gonna die. And it's gonna brick the camera. It, it, eventually, batteries stop holding a charge, even rechargeable ones. This is why most people throw out their phone after a few years. With this camera, you can put anything you want in it that's a AAA. You can put in the rechargeable lithium ion ones that I've just shown you, which you can buy for like 30, 40 Australian dollars and have it be rechargeable. Or you can put in alkalines. You can really do whatever you want. You can go to the store and pick up photography grade, regular lithium disposable batteries if you wanted to. The choice is yours. You can run it off 600 film if you want to. The choice is yours. But with these modern Polaroid cameras, you're kind of boned. You're gonna to need to send the camera to a technician once this battery dies. This is something that I'm working on is lithium ion replacements. I have replaced the battery in this one so that it's working. And uh, a fellow Perth-based photographer, Ashley is actually gonna send me a Polaroid i1 so that I can figure out how the battery works in that as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, for roughly the same price of purchasing one of these modern Polaroids, you can end up getting a classic one refurbished to take triple A's and be able to shoot whatever it is that you want. So in my opinion, really cool little thing to do. Um, and these cameras can usually be found secondhand pretty darn cheap. In my humble opinion, very worth getting a tech to just overhaul it, clean it inside and out, make sure it's all nice and working. And uh, yeah, give you the choice of whatever the heck film you wanna put in here really. 
Um, but yeah, that's all I really wanted to cover today. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Um, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, I'm really just trying to crank out as many of these videos as I can. I'll probably do eye type and overhauls on many 600s. Um, I've had a few people contact and ask me what's coming up and truth of the matter is I don't know It really depends on what clients send me to repair So if you've got something that you would like me to repair, please feel free to get in touch You can use any of the uh, the links down below um, But yeah, I'd love to see what you have in terms of Polaroid cameras um, Yeah, leave a comment below if this is something you'd be interested in um, Give us a like, give us a subscribe. Uh, and if you simply just like what I do, if you like the content that I'm producing and you like all of my repair knowledge and you want to say thanks without necessarily sending me something to fix, uh, you can always buy me a beer or two using the little coffee link below. Uh, I really appreciate any donations that I get. Um, anyway, I will see you guys next time and uh, have a wonderful day.